Welcome to the museum. This is going to be a little interview conducted in November of 2007 with Francis Hughes. Mr. Hughes is one of the few remaining people who can remember actually participating in the building of this structure. Notice the small rocks on the bottom and the larger rocks on top. We'll go to the interview and he has an interesting story to tell about how this building was built. Inside the museum you will see some flagstones on the floor. These were brought from the Beaver Dam area over to help build the museum. This is a view of the side of the museum. So, we are here uh, talking with Francis Hughes. And the purpose of this little conversation is to see if he can remember some interesting things about uh, working on the building which is now the Virgin Valley Heritage Museum. And so what I'd like to do is ask some questions. Well, there was a lot, was a foreman and down in the riverbed there and gathered those uh, little, uh, partly uniform. They were hauled out on an old uh, foreign truck. A truck. Hauled, hauled to the thing and then they were placed on the, on the wall with a mortar of cement. Now the rocks only go up to a certain level. Um, tell us about the opportunities you had to make a little money with this job. Well I think it was uh, something like, like uh, the CCC. It wasn't exactly that but it was a government project. Yeah. National Youth National Youth Administration. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, I think we were given seventeen dollars a month. Okay. And that in those those days, how far did seventeen dollars go? Oh, what you, would it do? You could buy a gallon of gas for twenty cents, mm -hmm. buy a loaf of bread for a dime, mm -hmm. buy a gallon of, or a gallon of milk for fifteen cents. So that seventeen dollars went quite a long ways. Um. Now. Do you remember some of the boys that your age group that helped build it and tell us how you worked with them? I don't quite remember most of the boys' names. I think there was a Stuart Pulsifer and an Orson Levitt. And I just don't remember the other boys. There was one of the Barnum boys. Emmett or Lester Barnum won, but the others I don't remember. But there's about 12 of us boys that helped those uh, two in charge. At the time, according to what I learned, Leonard Reber was principal of the school. That's true. He How was. How was he involved in the project? Well, I, I think he was the one that got it started a, as a youth program. I think it was uh, through the school district that they were able to get a small grant from the government to do this job. And so, um, did the work you did occur after school or during the summer? Or when did it happen? Most most of it was during the summertime. Occasionally, there'd be a few that would uh, go if they had something special to do. There'd be a few go to do that after we got out of school, but most of it was uh, during the summer and on Saturdays. On Saturday, okay. So when the building was completed, what do you remember about the building as it began being used? What did they do with it? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first thing it was used for was a ho hospital. Okay, now they tell me it was a library for a short time. And then it was a hospital. 
So that, that's what we've learned. But I know it was a hospital for a long time. Uh, that could have happened because I went in the service oh, I in 42, and it was during oh. that time. Okay. Now, the only one that I remember that was born there was Bill Lee. There was 13 or 14 babies born in that hospital. Uh -huh. But okay. like I said, it could have been a, a library before that, I don't know. So when you got back out of the service, what do you remember about going there? Did you go there at all for any reasons? Well, yeah, I used to go there all the time. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, in help building it, we group that done all the building, uh, we went up on the Black Rock Mountain in, in Arizona and hauled the big timbers down that are uh, oh, part, of the roof? part of the roof. I see. We went up the Beaver Dam Wash up into Arizona and hauled, hauled the flagstone that's on the floor and on the things. So we, we helped build it. They were, they were the overseers and we boys were the ones that built the building. So Marion, your brother, was one of the assistant overseers? Yes. And Walter W. Hughes was the, the supervisor. supervisor. Um, do you remember anything about the story that to make it a hospital, they were asking for donations from the community to help buy the supplies? Do you recall anything about the the effort to change it over, or were you in the service? At the time? I was in doing the service. I, I was in the service for three years. Okay. So during that time, the building was practically complete when I left, okay. and I don't know what happened during those three years that I was absent. Okay. Uh, now, for that, as you say the most part of its existence, it was a hospital. Uh, tell us about who worked there and what you remember about the people that were there. Uh, the first ones that I remember, and that was after I got home from the service, was Bertha Howe. Okay. Tell us about Bertha. Bertha Howe was a grand lady. I don't know whether she was any more than just a, a nurse, whether she was a, a practical nurse or a registered nurse. I think she was a registered nurse. But anyway, I, if I don't, uh, if I remember right, she and her husband came from Ohio. And uh, Bertha was a town nurse, but there was a doctor that came out once or twice a, a month from Las Vegas, a Dr. Woodbury. Okay. I remember that. And of course, like I said, that was after I returned from the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, every person that had ailments went to Bertha. She, she was the only nurse that we had in town, and she relayed with the doctors in St. George, got information from them, or Dr. Uh, Woodbury in Las Vegas. He, he was the Clark County doctor at that time. So I'm told Bertha was very uh, good at uh, taking care of sick people, whether it's night or day. All the time. It okay. made no difference. And her husband, I'm told, took care of the weather station or something? He like did that, and then we had, had a siren right there on the uh, building that he blew for uh, signal okay. any time. Okay. I've heard my son tell, like, scared him to death when Mr. Howe would blow, blow that okay. big, big old uh, siren. siren. And Mr. Howe was working with some uh, geology outfit looking for uh, uh, minerals all in these virgin mountains here. And he had trails all over those mountains. And I'm told he was a mining engineer at one time. He was, yes. Uh huh. So then uh, they tell me when Bertha uh, got sick in the 70s. She had to give up the job and passed away in 1977. You remember anything about that time? Uh, yes. 
my wife and I lived right to the side of the, the hospital. And anything that Bertha needed done, we were there to help her. But when she became quite ill, she'd been in the hospital in St. George. They brought her home, and uh, my wife helped take care of her there. Nora Levitt was another one. Uh, Ber Bertha's niece, niece or granddaughter. I think it was a niece. A niece from... Uh, Kentucky, was it? Uh, out east somewhere. It, it was from Kentucky, right, right by uh, Ohio. She okay. had to cross the Ohio River from Kentucky to in Ohio. Her niece came, and she borrowed my car. Oh. And I didn't even know what she'd done. Said she wanted to borrow my car. It was gone two days, and she took Bertha, put her on an airplane, and flew her back to. Oh, uh, Kentucky. That's where she died. Oh. She called Nora Levitt, uh, th this niece, called Nora Levitt and told me my car was down to Phil Abbott's in Las Vegas to go get it. Really? That was the last I heard of him. Isn't that amazing? Well, now they tell me that after she died, they closed the building for a while, and then the Boy Scouts took it over. That, that's true. And yeah. You, what do you remember about those years? Not not too much. I knew they did have have a scout troop there. I think there was only one uh, troop in town, and and they did have their meetings and things there, but not knowing you know the context and everything that they did there, I, I really don't know. And then of course the city of Mesquite was incorporated, and they made a decision to preserve it. As that's, a museum. That's true. What do you remember about those days, about the city getting organized and the museum being created? Well, there was at that time, uh, Bertha and Mr. Howe lived in, in the building. And they had two rooms, and at first there was only just the foyer, the main room there. And then after the city incorporated, and the city took it over as, as a project. They added on to the building. Now, I think they added on two extra rooms. I'm not sure. But uh, there was a discrepancy in, in the property lines there. My brother Esmond on the east side, me on the west side, owned the property. Well, the property lines overlap. And uh, Mr. Owen, Jim Owens, when he came into town, he was the one that got it straightened out. Oh. Esmon traded so much and I traded so much. Oh. Very interesting. So you got, the, got it accurate finally. Yes. Uh -huh. Jim went right back to the first property owners of, of the valley and took it right from the first property owner right on down. Well, I know in the museum we have, I think, a couple things that your family has donated there. I think there's an old stove there. Yeah, that's a stove, and there should be an old uh, De La Valle separator. Uh, yeah, I think I, think I see that. Uh -huh. I my, that. my uniform and my uh, mother-in-law's uh, wedding dress sh should be there. I believe it, I see the wedding dress, and the uniform is from your... From the service. From the service. Where did you serve? I served in North Africa, all over North Africa, the three Mediterranean islands, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, and Italy. So I've seen that part of the country. Were you involved in any conflicts or battles? Uh, no, I, I wasn't in any battles. I was in the Signal Corps, and we was always behind the lines. Well, this is great to talk to you, and I sure appreciate this time. And before we're done, I'm going to get you this to, to tell a little story about this. Uh, tell us the, about that hammer. The, the, this old uh, iron hammer was Walter Hughes's hammer. 
Walter Hughes was the cobbler in town. He was also the co uh, coffin maker. He made all the coffins for the people in town. And this is the hammer he used. And this is the hammer that was used on the building. Any place, there isn't too many places that a hammer could be used on this uh, old, uh, museum building. But this hammer was one that he used in that building of that building. And you've taken a few swings with it. I've okay. taken a few swings with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sure is nice to share this time with you, and we're hoping that you'll be around for many more times. So well, sure I hope so. Know. I don't know how much longer. I am the oldest uh, member that was born here in Mesquite that's still alive. I am the only World War II veteran that went from this valley that's still here. There are five other uh, members. One of them is my brother Owen, one is Dill Strasser, and one is Odin Barnum, my nephews. One is Reed Levin in Las Vegas, or in Henderson. The other one is in uh, Albie Colton in uh, Washington, and Stuart Postfer in Salt Lake. They're the only ones they're, left. They're the only ones left of all of us that went from this valley. Well, this is a wonderful moment. I sure appreciate all this. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that I can remember a few things that happened. I'm glad you had those questions because I wouldn't remember too much otherwise. Well, we appreciate this. Here's the cream separator that Mr. Hughes mentioned. Here's the stove. Here's the wedding dress.